Well, good afternoon. I'm Susan Elliott, and I'm the president and CEO of the National Committee on American Foreign Policy. I'd like to welcome all our participants to today's program, Economy, Security, and U.S. Leadership Abroad, the Future of Global Interdependence. You know, the National Committee on American Foreign Policy in October of this year launched uh, an inaugural series trying to tackle difficult questions surrounding the future of globalization. In a year that we feel deeply scarred, not only by the global pandemic, but then uh, also by other uh, global issues, we thought that this would be a great time to have a discussion on what the US role in the international system would be, especially now that we know we will have a new um, administration in January. So over the past few months, we've gathered experts in the field and we have conducted a series of roundtable, private roundtable discussions examining questions related to globalization, global interdependence, and the US role in the world. So this panel, um, I'm pleased to say, is the culmination of these discussions and we're honored to have such distinguished panelists here with us today who will share their thoughts on these complex issues. Um, one technical note that I'd like to mention before we start, I'm sure that most of our are familiar with Zoom, but the way we will take questions is if you look at the bottom of your screen and you click on the Q&A function, please, as you, um, as you have a question come up, uh, type your question into the Q&A function and uh, we will monitor the questions and about uh, halfway through the program or whenever Professor um, uh, Farrell is ready, we will begin to take questions from the audience. If you're joining us by telephone, you can also in real time send your questions to contact at ncafp.org so you can email them. Uh, we will also record the session and it will be available for viewing online on our website at ncafp.org in a day or so. So now it's my honor and privilege to introduce the moderator of today's discussion. Um, it's Professor Henry Farrell, and he's the Stavros Niarhos Foundation Agora Institute Professor of International Affairs at SAIS. And we're very pleased to have Henry to lead our discussion today. He works on a variety of topics, including democracy, the politics of the internet, and international and comparative political economy. He's also the author of a new book of Privacy and Power, The Transatlantic Fight Over Freedom and Security. He wrote that with Abe Newman, and I highly recommend it uh, as a great reading. So uh, Henry, with that, I'll turn the discussion over to you. Well, thank you very much. And I'm really, uh, I'm grateful and I'm honored to be able to moderate a discussion with two such wonderful people to really talk in a very sophisticated way about what has happened and what is likely to happen in a new Biden administration. So we have Jennifer Hillman, who is currently a fellow at the Council of Foreign Relations. And she is also a professor at Georgetown uh, University's Law School. And she has a long career in the, uh, in the policy of trade. She has uh, been a fellow at the appellate body of the World Trade Organization. She has worked in the uh, office of the US Trade Representative. She really has a deep, deep understanding of the trade related aspects of interdependence and has been directly involved in policy making and in analysis over a long period of time. Joe Nye, uh, similarly, is somebody who, re who has both policy and intellectual, uh, intellectual credentials. He is a former dean of the Kennedy School. He is a former assistant secretary of defense. Uh, and he is also, I should say, the author of a important recent book, which I had the honor to be able to interview him for the uh, Washington Post about, Morals Matter, which looks at the role of morals in uh, foreign policy from the uh, FDR presidency to, through to Donald Trump. So I recommend this book. It is a fun book and it is a book that uh, I have learned a lot from. So what I'd like to do is I would like to, to first of all, 
asks the question which Susan posed here, which is really that we're about to see a new sea change, perhaps, or a perhaps not a sea change, I'm sort of, it depends on what way you view it, in United States foreign policy as it applies to interdependence and China. So we will see the Biden administration taking office in January. Uh, there is going to be a lot of difference, presumably, with the Trump administration, but there is also going to be some continuity. There is clearly going to be some skepticism about, in particular, the trade relationship relationship with China and what kinds of consequences that has for uh, that, that has for the global interdependent world that we have created. So I'm wondering perhaps if Jennifer could begin by briefly talking perhaps to some of the trade aspects of that. Well, thank you very much. And it's an honor and a pleasure for me to be here and to join this, this tremendous panel. Um, I'll start by saying I think two things that will clearly change uh, in the Biden administration in terms of its approach to China. Um, and the only issue for me is how quickly you will see that change. But the two big ones are going to be that I think the Biden administration has made it clear already um, that they do not intend to follow the go it alone, the United States alone putting tariffs on China. Um, their approach is going to be very much to work with allies because it's really clear, I think, that when you look at the issues that we have with China, many, if not most, of our allies share the substantive concerns that the United States has had over the increasing degree of state ownership and state control coming out of China, the increasingly aggressive approach that China has taken. Everyone shares the concerns over it, but what they don't share is the US's unilateral tactics. This idea of US putting on tariffs uh, and the US-China trade war being largely fought outside the confines of the WTO or other multilateral institutions. The second thing I think that you will see early on is a, an, an, an effort by the Biden administration to clarify what are the goals of this trade war. I mean, if you think about it, uh, when the Trump administration first came out with its Section 301 report, which is what started this whole China trade war, the emphasis was on intellectual property theft and technology transfers. That was the concern. And yet when you saw what happened, the first thing they did was say, no, 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 we want you to reduce the trade deficit by $200 billion. So it really, and then from then on, it became this real question of what's the goal of the United States? Is it to use this to build a tariff wall around the United States, which is sometimes what you've heard from the Trump administration? Is it to go the other way and force a complete decoupling of our trade relationship with China? Is it actually to address intellectual property or technology transfer? Is it to get at what is, to me, one of the more important concerns, which is the increasing degree of Communist Party control, subsidies, state-owned enterprises that are creating, you know, again, a very aggressive and sort of unfairly trading China. So on those two fronts, working with allies and clarifying the goals of this ongoing difficulty in the relationship with China, that's what I think you'll see sort of relatively early in the, in the process. So, so Joe, this is something you've thought about a lot as well. You had a piece in the Washington Quarterly, I believe, in March of this year, talking about power and interdependence in the relationship with China. So what thoughts do you have about how the uh, Biden administration is going to go about this? Well, I, I agree very much with what Jennifer said. Uh, let me just add a, a couple of uh, other points. Um, I think the, there's a lot of talk about a new cold war with China and a decoupling from China. And um, I think that's sort of a s excessive rhetoric. We're, we're not going to have a new cold war if you take the historical metaphor seriously. When we had um, the real cold war with the Soviet Union, we had almost no trade. Uh, we now have half a trillion dollars of trade. Uh, it's going to decrease perhaps, but it's not going to go back to Cold War levels. Similarly, in the, in the real Cold War, uh, we had almost no social contact with, uh, with Soviets. Uh, we have, what, 370,000 Chinese students in the United States. It's, it's not the same game. The, 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 the Soviet threat in that day was military and ideological. Uh, the Chinese challenge is much more a question of technology and practices in the economy in which they're using what you might call a market Leninist system uh, to play the game of capitalism internationally, but also to rig the game uh, with this party control. That's a very different game. It's not a cold war. 
and we're not going to decouple from them and our allies aren't going to decouple from them so we're going to have to have a much more subtle strategy i think the i think the biden people understand that i don't think the trump people did at least not the president himself so the president um, focused on the bilateral trade deficit which is really to some extent not the main problem and the points that jennifer raised about the technological challenge uh, even though they talked about it, they didn't do anything about it. And they didn't use the allies with them. So I, I agree very much with what she said. And I think we got to be careful not to build this up into a Cold War and realize it's a new type of strategic challenge. I think it's very interesting that both of you have picked up on this question you know, of what you call market Leninism and the intersection with technology and Jennifer's discussion of how uh, state-owned enterprises and the uh, ownership relationships pose this important challenge. So, uh, Joe, how do you think, if you were to advise the Biden administration on how it should approach this set of questions, what kinds of things could the uh, could a new administration do in order to uh, try and uh, deal with this challenge? Well, I think you first of all have to have a dialogue, uh, a serious one, and we might as well tell the Chinese uh, straight on that there are certain areas where we are going to decouple, uh, where they relate to our security. I mean, as you've written, you're written very well, uh, asymmetrical interdependence is a source of power. And to allow the Chinese to build a fifth generation uh, telecommunications that would allow them to control the internet of things in the United States is just not possible. But, and so we have to face that there are going to be areas where there'll be security decoupling and should be. I would not let Huawei build in the United States. At the same time, there's no reason to worry about import of railroad cars, subway cars, which if they're more efficiently made in China and they're not made with state-owned subsidies, but if we can show that, then it's better to save taxpayer dollars by getting better railway cars. So we need to have a discussion about what are the areas where we're going to agree to disagree for security reasons and just fence those off. And then what are gonna be the rules of the road for trade in the other areas where we can object to subsidies to state-owned enterprises and, and uh, other devices that coerce the intellectual uh, property transfer and so forth. But I think we've got to get that uh, clear that there's some areas where security means we're not going to have a discussion. There are other areas where, yes, there's a lot to discuss. So Jennifer, uh, how do how do you think about this and the policy options that are open to the Biden administration, given the existing multilateral system of rules? What kinds of po possibilities would you see there for the Biden administration, both perhaps to build up the regime again, but to do it in a way that is perhaps uh, less uh, vulnerable to these uh, questions, which people weren't really thinking about as systematically back when China uh, actually joined the WTO? Well, again, I think I'll start where you just ended, which is whether you should do something in the WTO to respond. Uh, to the fact that at some level things have really changed and I think changed in a way that was not expected and is not consistent with the rules in terms of where China has gone. I mean, if you look at what happened when China joined the WTO in 2001, China made a huge number of changes to its system in order to make sure that it was coming into compliance uh, with the obligations that it agreed to take on. But if you step back and look at what happened then, China was kind of on this path where it was becoming more of a market-based economy, more of a, you know, decisions based more on commercial terms. But there's no question that at some point, and again, people could debate at what that point that was, China made a very significant new turn uh, where it is becoming more state-owned. Uh, you have the state-owned enterprises that existed becoming bigger and bigger, being merged with one another. You have an increasing, again, role of the Communist Party with Communist Party members sitting on the boards of even the foreign owned joint ventures and a realization that that communist party member, even though it's one out of however many members on a board, the boards are coming to realize if you don't vote with that communist party member, uh, all of a sudden the company gets no permits, no licenses. So the control is becoming much more significant and China is becoming more uh, willing to push back on the basic notion that the WTO rules are supposed to be based on market-based principles. 
Uh, again, that was one of the presumptions. Um, and if you look at just what came out, uh, you know, again, in September, there's a meeting of the G20 uh, trade and investment ministers, um, and they were supposed to just basically affirm what are the principles, the underlying principles of the world-based trading system. One of them was that it is a market-oriented, uh, you know, based on market-oriented principles, and China refused. China refused to have that come out as part of the declaration of what does everybody agree to. So some of what we're going to have to do is think about, can we have a system that exists uh, that is based on market-based principles if uh, uh, the single largest trading country uh, doesn't agree uh, with uh, that basic principle? The second place in which I think the U.S. is going to clearly have to go, and it's going to be difficult, is rethinking the discipline on subsidies. So right now, the general rules are that you are not supposed to trade in goods that have been made on the back of significant government subsidies if that trade causes harm, I mean, whether that's material injury or adverse effects to others. In other words, whether your subsidies created products that caused harm. The problem has been that those disciplines are very difficult to enforce, both because of the definitions of what's a subsidy are difficult to, to accept, um, the evidence is too difficult, and the remedy is not very effective because remedies in the WTO are prospective. So again, how much good does it do to show that China is now producing way too much steel on the backs of way too many subsidies if you can only get a remedy that is prospective when China's already built all these steel plants and they're pushing steel out into the world? So there's gonna have to be some rethinking about how we discipline subsidies. And it gets more complicated because the United States and Europe and, and most of the Western world is gonna have to start increasing our own subsidies in order to take on the fight against COVID in order to take on the fight against climate change. So we're gonna to have to have a serious discussion about whose subsidies are okay in what instances and whose are not, where we're trying to say these Chinese subsidies are not okay, but somehow ours are. So that is gonna be one of the big challenges, I think, for the WTO and for the trading system generally. Okay, and Susan, if I, or Jennifer, rather, if I can ask a follow-up question, which is to, which is, uh, Joe mentioned the uh, importance of thinking about security when we think about decoupling and so on. And obviously there's a big debate on that at the uh, multilateral WTO level as well. When we think about, for example, the justification that Trump offered for uh, the uh, steel tariffs, when we think about the uh, dispute between Russia and uh, Ukraine and the uh, judgment there. So uh, the query, I guess, from the point of view of people who believe that the WTO is a good system is, you know, there have been this exception there. And uh, this exception is now being used uh, to an extent that it hasn't been uh, used hitherto. How do you ensure that the security exception, on the one hand, helps to encompass perhaps some of the uh, uses that uh, Joe referred to, but on the other hand, that the exception doesn't gobble up the rule? Well, again, I, I think it's, it's an excellent question. I mean, as, as you have sort of alluded to, um, ever since, you know, the general agreement on tariffs and trade, the GATT was put together in 1947, there's always been this notion of an exception for national security purposes. Because uh, again, no country wanted to give up their sovereign right uh, to protect their national security. So what that article of the GATT says is that each country can determine what is in its own national security interest um, and each country can impose measures um, that it judges to be essential to that protection. But there's a big caveat there. If they're related to trade in nuclear materials, trafficking in arms or ammunition, or taken in a time of war or other international emergency. So again, I think back in the GATT days, there was really this sense of cabining off the national security exception to what I think would generally be agreed upon as within that realm of national security. The, the problem now is that the Trump administration has imposed these tariffs on steel and aluminum, which at least I've argued don't fit within any of those categories. They're not uh, you know, nuclear arms ammunition taken in a time of war. And they've been challenged at the WTO. We don't yet have a ruling but as you alluded to, there has been a decision for the first time interpreting this Article 21 in a case involving a fight between Russia and Ukraine over, over Russian restrictions. And to me there, the jurisprudence at least that's come down, I mean, the ruling has come down is, yes, there should be great deference given to a country to decide what is in its national security, but at some level, it has to fit within one of those boxes um, and it has to have been done in good faith. And I think what we're going to see is the WTO ruling that what the Trump administration did in steel and aluminum doesn't work. 
Um, and then, you know, again, I think we're going to have to see this play out. Uh, but there's no question that trying to figure out where to draw a line, which has somewhat now been erased between economic security and national security, is one of the big challenges um, that's going to face the WTO. So, Joe, if we think about this at the domestic level in the United States, my experience or my perception, at least as an outsider, is that the uh, United States is not well, the administration is not well geared institutionally to uh, think systematically about the equities between economics and security and sort of you have bits and pieces of the apparatus there, but because people have been thinking about these in different boxes for a while, there isn't the kinds of uh, institutional knowledge that would really allow you to figure out how to deal with this in a more systematic way. So how do you think that that's going to change over the next few years and how should it change? What kinds of things should the United States be doing in order to better think through the equities of uh, the benefits of interdependence versus the vulnerabilities uh, now that that has become a big, you know, perhaps the big debate in uh, international politics over the next few years? Well, uh, I to give the Trump administration some credit, I, I don't usually do that. Um, uh, there is the Committee on Foreign Investment in the US, CFIUS, which looks at inward investment into the United States, uh, which can have uh, very important security implications as well as trade implications. And that was strengthened in the Trump period. Um, and I think broadened and strengthened. So I think that's a step in the right direction. That brings relevant agencies together, uh, which pulls the government uh, into one uh, position. Uh, the other thing I think is the coordination with the White House. The National Economic Council has to work closely with the National Security Council in terms of dealing with the intersection between straight economic and uh, security type of issues. And I suspect, uh, knowing that Jake Sullivan and his breadth of interests, uh, that you're probably going to see that type of coordination of NEC, SEC, uh, NSC in the Biden White House. Um, but it's still early in the process. But definitely, you're right. Uh, we've got to make sure that things don't fall between the stools. The interesting questions are going to be really in some of the areas of new technologies. Uh, how are we going to look at the questions of what is a danger in a new technological area, whether it's artificial intelligence, quantum computing, and so forth? And so the NSC is going to have to look at these not just in terms of existing patterns of trade, uh, but also in terms of future uh, threats to security. And uh, that's going to take a beefing up of, of the capacity in the White House, which hasn't been there in the Trump administration. Let me just remind the, uh, the, uh, uh, the audience that uh, if you have any questions, that you should use the questions and answers feature to ask them. Uh, uh, and I will turn to uh, questions and answers from the audience in a few minutes. But I'd like to ask Joe uh, another question first, which is a few years ago, uh, your uh, friend and collaborator for decades, Bob Cohane, gave a speech in your honor. And uh, part of what he used that speech for was to complain about how we, and sort of meaning people in the international relations, uh, scholarly community, we in the sort of policy community more generally, had thought about trade in ways that focused on the general benefits without looking at the specific consequences, for example, for particular communities in the United States, and how this had led us uh, perhaps to undermine the political support for uh, multilateralism over a uh, long period. So uh, to, what do you think the uh, plausible remedies are for that? What kinds of things should we be doing? And Joseph, you can argue it both ways. On the one hand, uh, public opinion polls suggest that support for trade is uh, as high or higher than it's ever been. On the other hand, I'm sort of uh, clearly one of the reasons why uh, Donald Trump got so many votes as he did is because there are plausibly people who are unhappy with their economic circumstances and who are blaming, uh, quote, global elites for that. So. How do we deal with that problem of connecting the domestic to the international again? Well, I think, that, I think it's an important point. And as usual, Bob was right. Um, what's good for the whole is not always good for each of the parts. And in a democracy, if some of the parts are suffering, particularly if they have significant uh, voting power in key states in the electoral college, 
uh, that's going to mean you can't do in trade what you need to do uh, because they're going to resist that. Uh, we saw that with, uh, alas, the uh, Trans-Pacific Partnership, which was actually pretty carefully negotiated part, uh, trade deal with very high labor and environmental standards and technology standards, uh, which the Trump administration withdrew from. Uh, one of the questions for Biden is, can he rejoin the what's now called the CP, uh, Comprehensive uh, Pacific uh, tra uh, Trans-Pacific Trade Organization that Japan has kept alive, kept a seat open for us, but will domestic politics prevent that? And it may. Um, it may be too hard to, to try to regain that. The, ironically, what that does is leave trade in Asia, where China is the uh, primary trading partner for almost all the Asian countries. Uh, and China has now uh, joined the RCEP, the uh, Regional Comprehensive Economic Program uh, in Pacific trade. Uh, where we don't, we are not present. So the domestic politics that inhibit us from uh, going into these trade agreements, in this case TPP, um, are bad for us in terms of our geostrategic interests. But they are understandable if you're thinking about a, a town in Ohio which has seen its uh, plants uh, uh, vanish both to China or to. Uh, to uh, Vietnam. And uh, so it, it, it's a real dilemma in, in, in a democracy of how do you organize this? But I think uh, as Danny Roderick, another colleague of mine at Harvard put it, uh, we saw hyper-globalization in the 90s without a sufficient amount of attention to these distributional issues. And in a democracy, you just can't do this. There's going to have to be adjustment assistance. There's going to have to be areas uh, in which uh, if we don't do that, we're not going to be able to do what we need on the trade front. Jennifer, this is a issue that you have thought about a lot as well. Um, you know, sort of, I, I, and I presume it's something when you were the general counsel at the USTR, you, uh, you know, and in your other capacities, you have engaged pretty directly in the conversations about how the domestic and the international, you know, domestic politics and international politics intersect here. So what is your sense of the possibilities that are open to reconnect here? So uh, I'll just start with, I do think um, there's a lot of, uh, if you will, blame to go around about how do we end up where we've ended up. Um, and I think some of the blame is on the communication side, because I do think a lot of, of those of us that do at, at some core level believe in the multilateral sort of rules-based system, uh, you know, did not do a, a good enough job of pushing back on the fundamental message uh, that, that President Trump was conveying, which is, just blame all of whatever is your domestic ill. You know, your roads are crumbling, your schools are not as good, uh, job, you know, wages aren't growing. Blame that on foreign, whether that's a foreign person coming in, whether that's a foreign good coming in, whether that's a foreign investment coming in, blame it on all things foreign. Uh, and at the same time, I would say, and particularly in the United States, we have not done a very good job um, at, at understanding what it's gonna take to actually push back. I mean, it doesn't do very much good to come up with yet another study that says, oh no, you didn't lose your job to trade, you lost it to technology. I mean, it doesn't make any difference for the person that's on the losing end of that job. So what we have not done, and again, here, I think the US is a real outlier, is invest in our people. I mean, if you look at what the average OECD country spends, in terms of long-term investment in worker training and support. Most of the European countries are spending between two and 3% of their total GDP um, as a long-term investment in their people, in worker training programs, in you know, portable pensions, healthcare. What do we spend in the United States? 0.27%. We simply don't invest in our people. That's got to change. And I do think that is part of the Biden sort of build back better strategy. But the other thing where I think we're outliers is in the degree to which we allow sort of trade, trade agreements and sort of tax policy generally to make the gap in income, I mean, the wealth inequality in the United States, again, an outlier in comparison to everywhere else. And that's partly because we tax labor so heavily and don't tax capital very heavily. That's partly because of uh, the sort of heavily, heavy focus of American corporations on shareholder value to the exclusion of supporting consumers or 
uh, communities or others. So we are outliers on a lot of this. And so part of it is also bringing the United States sort of back into better balance with even the rest of, of the OECD countries in terms of what we are doing to support um, your average worker, what we are doing to invest in infrastructure, what we are doing across the board in terms of investments in education, R&D, and innovation. We're simply behind on all of that, and there's going to be a large and necessary catch-up that needs to occur. Jennifer, one final question, which I'll also ask to Joe, which is another important difference between Europe and the United States. It comes with regard to the fight against climate change. And you see a lot of discussion in Europe, you know, sort of potentially uh, border taxes on carbon and similar type measures, which have consequences for the international trade regime. It's also possible, depending on what happens uh, in the United States, that the Biden administration, if it isn't able to get much done in, in the way of domestic legislation, may start looking to uh, external instruments as a means of getting things done on climate change that it can't get passed through the uh, Congress. So what do you think are the possible strategies forward? What are the downsides for those strategies and how might this affect the uh, multilateral trading system? Well, I'll just say by starting out, I'll put my own cards on the table that I believe that the easiest and best way to, to get serious about climate change is to impose a carbon tax. Uh, again, there's lots of other options out there. There's lots of other different ways to do it. But my own view is by far the most straightforward and easiest way to do it is put a tax on carbon. Uh, and again, the more that put a tax on carbon, the better. So again, I would encourage this for everyone. But then I think you are going to have to have a border adjustment. I mean, I think you are going to have to say, OK, uh, we understand that if we put a high carbon tax on in the United States, those companies that are engaging in production that uses a lot of energy are going to bear a disproportionate share of that cost. They're going to need to be protected from imports coming in from countries that don't have um, a, a carbon tax or a border uh, carbon price. And uh, if we don't do that, uh, the, the, you know, the issue will be simply that the steel companies all pick up and move uh, to wherever doesn't have a price on carbon. So for both the leakage issue and, and, the, and the competitiveness issues, we're going to need a border adjustment. Ditto for um, US exports going abroad. The problem is going to be um, in order to make that WTO legal, and you can definitely do it um, if it's you know under the WTO rules, as long as um, you have a price, a tax on your own domestic product, you can then put on any kind of border measure you want in terms of an import tax and an export rebate, as long as it is functionally equivalent to what your own domestic producers are paying. And so that becomes the huge issue in Europe. I mean, how do you say if they put a 10% tariff on all goods to pay a carbon tax, how is that 10% equivalent to what Europe is doing with its emissions trading system, particularly with all the free allowances that um, many of the European companies are still enjoying under the ETS? You have to be able to show that it's fair, uh, that whatever is being imposed domestically is the equivalent of what is being posed at the border. And so again, that will be also the difficulty for the Biden administration in terms of how do you impose a border adjustment um, in the absence of a domestic tax or other uh, carbon system here in the here you know imposed in the United States. So it is to me a very straightforward exercise, but it is going to require that demonstration of fairness that you're not imposing uh, an import measure that is effectively just a protectionist measure or just designed to raise um, tariff revenue. So Joe, what is your sense more generally of the possibilities for the Biden administration? working against climate change in this inter interdependent world, uh, but also in a world where the United States has a strong and continuing internal partisan divisions, which uh, largely map onto uh, disagreement about uh, what to do about uh, climate change and whether to do anything about it in the first place. Well, I, I agree with Jennifer. I think if we could get a carbon tax, um, that would be the most important step we could take. I'm, uh, and there are many Republicans as well as Democrats who support that. George Schultz, for example, taken a lead on that over the years. But uh, I, frankly, in political terms, I think it's a low probability. And uh, it, particularly if the, the Senate stays in Republican hands, I don't think it's going to happen. Uh, so I think John Kerry is this new climate envoy is going to have his hands full. You're going to see more work done on executive orders. You do more for uh, research for R&D and, and uh, clean energy and, and uh, things of that sort. Um, so there are things we can do, but 
uh, frankly, it, it, putting a price on carbon would be the, the single most important thing, but it doesn't strike me as likely in this political climate. So let me move to questions from the audience. And uh, Tim Ferguson says that there is apparent bipartisan hostility towards the People's Republic of China in Congress. And he wants to know what the consequences of that are going to be for Biden administration policy. Yeah, I, I, I'll, I'll start, I guess. I mean, first of all, I will agree with the premise of the question. I think there is no question that of all of the trade policies out there, the one where there is clear support on both sides of the aisle is to be tough on China. And, and then, then we get into the details of what does it mean to be tough on China. And there, I think you will have a very wide divergence between those that are pushing all the way for as much decoupling as possible, every kind of incentive to encourage companies to leave China, uh, and again, uh, huge efforts, if you think about it, even in the context of fighting the pandemic, you know, again, a huge issue of don't be reliant on China for medical supplies or pharmaceuticals or any of that. So you, you yes, there is a, a bipartisan consensus. Um, I, I think it, it, it means that there is no chance that the Biden administration is not going to continue um, to push very hard on China across a broad array of issues. Um, I just think it comes back to where I started from, but I think being done sort of with allies and with much clearer goals. And the other thing that I'll add to that, just sort of coming out of this discussion about climate, um, is the other place where I do think you're going to start to see an increasing level of bipartisan support is the notion that we have to do something to respond uh, to China's Belt and Road Initiative. And I would say the most particular couple of things in the BRI that you're seeing consensus around is responding to the fact that um, for, what, for all that the good that the BRI may be doing to helping countries that, that have been desperately needing uh, emphasis on investments in infrastructure and power and everything else, is the impact that it's having on climate change because the vast majority of the power facilities that China is building under BRI are coal-fired plants. Uh, so they are locking in these countries to a heavy carbon uh, intensive energy production. They're locking these countries into dependency on China for the coal that goes into those coal-fired plants. Um, and I do think you're going to start to see a big bipartisan uh, sense of we need to be responding uh, to, uh, to the BRI um, in ways that present alternatives to these countries that don't necessarily want to be reliant entirely on China for all of their infrastructure, but yet we're not really yet providing much of an alternative. I mean, we say to everybody, don't use Huawei or, or, or ZTE, I mean, Chinese technology, but we don't have 5G to offer as an alternative. Don't rely on China for some of your high-speed rail, but we don't have an alternative. So I do think there is going to be an emphasis there to try to figure out how, how, do, we, um, how do we respond to China because there is a bipartisan consensus that we need to remain very, very vigilant uh, in, in our response. Joe? Well, I, I agree with that. Uh, but let's also remember that the danger can be if we overdo it. Um, there are, uh, there are some areas where we can't decouple from China, even if we had the political will to do so. For example, on climate, uh, CO2, of which China produces 40% now of the emissions, China and the US produce 40%, but China the bigger part of that, uh, that doesn't respect borders, it's transnational. Uh, viruses, uh, and this is not the last pandemic we'll see, uh, they don't care the nationality or the borders of uh, what the humans are that they kill. And so the, these are issues that I call in my book um, issues where you have to have power with others, not just power over others. And uh, we're having, we had to have to work with China on these issues. So I call the overall relationship a cooperative rivalry. Uh, we can't possibly decouple from those issues and uh, therefore we're gonna have to work with them. And that means organizing other countries, allies, to press China to uh, deal with the, let's say the carbon composition of their ERI initiative, or to um, deal with the uh, questions of what they're doing in terms of adding new coal-fired plants. And those, I think uh, we've got to work with China, but if we don't do it alone in the bilateral bullying that uh, Trump had, or which you find 
uh, so popular in the Congress, you have to find ways to sort of surround them and push them because they do care about saving face. And uh, that's going to be where John Kerry can, can uh, earn his, his um, new salary. So if I can ask a follow-on question to that, uh, Ursula von der Leyen gave a, a talk at CFR a couple of weeks ago where she talked about uh, uh, talked about ways in which uh, the European Union and the United States could work together um, sort of as democracies with a clear implication being that they want to work together uh, against China, uh, at least on some issues, if not on others. You see a similar this debate happening among Biden people. You know, there's talk about this summit of the democracies, which is going to happen at some stage or another. So we seem to be moving towards, uh, at least on some issue areas, uh, rather than large end multilateralism with pretty well everyone who has a market system, towards a smaller end multilateralism where democracies cooperate on matters of specific interest to them. So how, how is this, you know, do you think that this is a sustainable way forward? And how do you begin to bridge you know, sort of this, um, this, this tension, which I think is identified in your answers, you know, where Jennifer spoke to the ways in which uh, democracies might have a common interest in fighting climate change and also in targeting Belt and Road Initiative type things. And this suggests that we want to work against China to some degree, uh, but, but also Joe suggesting that there are important areas where we need to continue to collaborate and cooperate. How do we manage to do the both at the one time? Time, given this uh, emphasis on uh, shifting focus towards uh, work among democracies rather than work among all countries with a broadly, uh, loosely uh, marketing focus? Well, it, it, I'll try it first shot and then Jennifer can, you know, my solution to this has been to think in terms of concentric circles. You're not going to restore the so-called liberal international system of post-1945, uh, pure and simple. Uh, there are some areas where we can get common agreement on rules, particularly those things which relate to sovereignty, uh, as we see in the UN system. Uh, there are other areas where we're just going to have different approaches. Um, and we can try to create higher standards among a group of democracies uh, and then try to uh, uh, see whether that inner circle can expand to broader circles. And at some point, it's conceivable that you could have uh, the Chinese finding themselves uh, uh, desiring to rejoin uh, the, the expanded inner circle. So I, I think if you think of these uh, prospects of, of concentric circles, it, it becomes feasible. Uh, Robert Knocky at the uh, Council on Foreign Relations has suggested something like this on uh, technologies, uh, cyber technologies, where you'd have a higher set of standards for a set of countries, but you'd leave open the prospect that as China changed its behavior, it might be able to join in some of this. So I think that might be the, at least the philosophical approach uh, to how you can uh, reconcile these different needs. I'll only add, well, first of all, I would I would commend um, the speech that was discussed. I mean, uh, it, it was a real tour de force performance. Um, and I would recommend anybody that's interested in the US EU relations to go back and, and watch that because it was it was quite a powerful speech. Um, secondly, I'd say, um, uh, you know, I think there is starting to be this notion, a, a colleague of mine at Georgetown Law wrote a book a couple of years ago called Mini Lateralism, you know, sort of promoting the notion that for every issue, you try to figure out maybe even what is the least number of countries that you need to start your concentric circle to pick up on what on what Joe Nye has just said, uh, to get, a, a, again, a coalition of those that is the least number that is really important to be effective. And I do think depending on what the issue is that you're debating, um, um, in terms of the response to China, it's going to it's going to change that geometry and who in terms of who needs to be in on this agreement in order for it to be effective. Um, and in a lot of places, my sense is it do, it wouldn't take a lot more than the United States and the European Union being on the same page on some of those issues. For others, you know, that cross every border, I think you're going to need a lot larger uh, coalition uh, coming together with an agreed upon set of rules. The other thing that, that Joe mentioned that I think is really important to think about is, is this issue of standards. Uh, because again, uh, what kind of standards are we talking about and governing what 
I think has a big effect on how on how many people need to be in on it. Uh, because again, it's, it's very clear, for example, within the telecommunications area, China is unequivocally trying to write the standards. I mean, you look at how much of a presence China has at the ITU and other standard setting organizations, those standards are, are being written, uh, you know, again, to favor China. Well, it's one thing to have standards that favor China as long as they remain operable with everyone else, as long as the rest of this entire telecommunication system is able to talk to one another. But if we get to the point where that's not true, uh, where we have a lack of operability among different systems, then I think you're going to need a very large coalition to figure out what is the alternative standards that everyone else is going to be joining. So it, I, I think the geometry here depends on what the issue is that you're debating, but there's no question that we're going to have to be better and more nimble at creating different coalitions for different issues um, that nonetheless allow us to set big enough sets of standards uh, that, that we're going to achieve the goal that, they, that the coalition is coming together for in the first place. So we've got a number of questions which have come in in the last few minutes. So I'll try to move through them, maybe targeting them more towards one of you so that we can move through as many as we possibly can. And so Jennifer Siebens asks a question, which I think is uh, perhaps for Jennifer more than for Joe. She asks, what is the health of the WTO as an international body? A very simple, straightforward question. Yeah. Uh, uh, the health right now is pretty poor. Um, uh, as many of you know, uh, the WTO needs a new director general. Uh, there had been a consensus to choose um, Dr. Ngozi from Nigeria, who had been the, uh, the number two at the World Bank and has been a longtime sort of international leader. Uh, and everyone thought there was a consensus to select her. Uh, and the United States blocked. Uh, um, there was, you know, again, the WTO dispute settlement system has this appellate body where, again, where I served as a member that is the sort of, if you will, the Supreme Court. I mean, the final appeals court for, for the WTO, the United States has blocked the appointment of any members uh, to the WTO. So now that whole operation is defunct, uh, which means that the dispute settlement system is no longer binding because if you, if you end up with a decision that you don't like, uh, and you don't want to comply with, all you have to do is file a notice of appeal to this non-existent appellate body, and it, it in essence stays the entire proceedings. So again, the health is poor. Uh, the system basically has a negotiating arm, an executive arm, and, a, and an adjudicatory arm. None of them are in good shape, and the system is very much out of balance. So I, I do think sort of an early on priority for the Biden administration is going to be to restore and reform the appellate body and the two have to go hand in hand. I, I don't think you can simply try to sort of go back to wherever we were uh, before the Trump administration came in. Uh, you're going to have to seriously address some of the longstanding complaints about uh, the dispute settlement system and to try to restore some better balance between the negotiating function, the executive function and the judiciary function. Um, I think it can be done. I mean, there's a lot of ideas out there. There's a lot of countries. Canada has been leading this Ottawa group to try to do that. It can be done, but it is going to take a serious commitment by the United States and others to say that we actually care about the WTO. We believe it is worth saving. It's worth fixing that on balance, what we get out of it is far more than what we've given up. Uh, but it's going to take a con serious concerted effort. And I think, uh, and it's going to have to be done with some significant degree of urgency. Okay, Jeffrey Lemon asks a question, which I think is more for Joe. Uh, this is about Joe's uh, colleague, Danny Roderick. And uh, Jeffrey says, uh, uh, more or less, or given that China is committed to uh, intense subsidies as part of its domestic policy, can this be accommodated in the kind of framework that Danny offers of uh, calibrated safeguards and countervailing duties where effectively, you know, and uh, he doesn't say this, but the uh, background to this is, is, of course, that Danny would like to see a much looser set of multilateral rules, allowing for much greater uh, experimentation at the uh, domestic level. So can this be accommodated and should this be? Well, I, my, I tend in that direction. Um, Danny worked with uh, uh, some other Western economists and Chinese economists to set forward categories. One category was where you had total preemptive capacity to exclude trade um, by your definition of whether it endangered your security or not. After all, China doesn't allow Google or Facebook to operate in China 
uh, because it's a threat to how they define security. Free speech is a threat, threat to security for the Communist Party. Uh, so there'd be one category where you'd say, uh, you, you it's like a preemptive challenge in the jury. The second category was areas where um, you could say, okay, my subsidy and your subsidy, it's hard. how do we reconcile them? Uh, this is the type of thing we saw with Boeing and Airbus in the US-European relationship. In other words, sometimes there's a difficulty in de defining a subsidy, but where you could say, okay, if we can't get an agreement on how to negotiate or how do we define these, uh, then we can cut back on trade or put on countervailing duties. But let's at least categorize these as areas to negotiate. The third area would be where what you decide has a strong impact on third countries or the rest of the world. And there you try to apply as much as possible the World Trade Organization rules to the extent, as Jennifer said, that we can get them back into working condition. I think if you, if you think of these three different categories, which as I say, Danny and some Chinese economists um, did a, a paper about, um, you have a, a framework for how to approach this. And um, I, so I, I, if, I think that is a reasonable approach. Pamela Spratlin asks a question, which I think either of you could uh, take on. And uh, summarizing, it's a long question. It's more or less, why should China look to the uh, US market-based capitalist system as a model, given the uh, great inequality that this produces and uh, what tools that the United States have in a world where that model has been somewhat discredited to ensure that China isn't able to just run all over the uh, US-based approach in multilateral settings? Well, Jennifer's turn first, I think. Well, um, uh, obviously China is now much more basically making that argument. I mean, it used to be that, and again, when China joined the WTO and other times, they indicated that they did see a value in moving towards a more market-based system. And they're now much more clearly saying, no, uh, you know, we think we have a better system. Our, our system is just simply better. Um, you know, again, part of it is going to depend on what the response to the rest of the world is. But I, I think the argument is that it is creating, again, some significant, um, if you will, unfairnesses. Um, and uh, part of that stems from the fact that at a very core level, uh, Chinese companies are, are, in essence, never go bankrupt. Uh, they're 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 going to always be bailed out by the state. Uh, it is creating, uh, and again, if you look at what's happening. So again, the question is sort of over what horizon. I mean, if you look at you know Nick Lardy, for example, from the Peterson Institute, did a study looking at these Chinese state-owned enterprises. And as Xi Jinping has really encouraged the Chinese state-owned enterprises to merge with one another to get bigger and bigger, what you're seeing is the return on assets in those state-owned enterprises going lower and lower and lower to the point where they're now below the cost of capital, meaning they're not, they're not making money, they're not even breaking even. So there, there's a reckoning coming even for these Chinese enterprises. And the question is, you know, sort of when does that reckoning come and does it come soon enough. And having said that, uh, the question is whether there's something of a compromise, because I think implicit in your question is exactly what I think I, I'm, I'm saying and others are saying, and clearly what Danny Roderick and others are saying, which is the U.S. just no holes barred, you know, that the, the notion that the raison d'etre for a corporation is money for shareholders, full stop. That's it. That's the only reason for a company to exist. That is also um, something that is, again, not sustainable, and we're seeing it as not sustainable in the United States. So where, the, where we come down in terms of trying to find a middle road uh, that suggests that, yes, there is a significant and important role for, for market capitalism, and on the other hand, uh, that some of what the Chinese model is doing um, has something to be commended about it, uh, and the extremes on both ends are not sustainable, I think may leave us with somewhere uh, more in the middle, and the question is whether we're, we're st we are still going to be more over on the capitalist side, they are still going to be more over on a non-market economy side, but whether we can push uh, for some greater meeting in the middle, again, I think is, is where we'll have to see how things play out. 
Karima Charchar, whose name I am sure I am doing no justice to whatsoever, has a short question, which is more or less, will Biden's administration be a return to the uh, policies of the Obama administration? Well, I don't think you can have a return uh, to the policies of the Obama administration, pure and simple, because uh, uh, the world has changed since 2016. Um, you can't ignore either the existence of the Trump uh, years, nor can you ignore the changes in Chinese behavior, some of which Jennifer uh, just described. So uh, you're not going to see a return. You're not going to see, uh, if you want, Obama redux. Um, but you are going to see a number of people who served in the Obama administration who have good experience and good instincts. and. Uh, who uh, I think will be able to manage what I call this uh, cooperative rivalry, which requires people who don't get so hung up on ideology that they uh, fail to uh, uh, see that you can overestimate as well as underestimate that challenge. Uh, and yet on the other hand, realize that Chinese uh, want their cake and eat it too. They wanna have access to markets and pretend that they're a market system when they're not. As I said, it's market Leninism. And the Leninism part of it, which means tight party control, is essential to their system. And it's very antithetical to ours. The good news is that when people say China is an ideological threat to us, um, no, we're an ideological threat to them. Nobody marches in the streets in favor of Xi Jinping thought with Chinese characteristics, as the Communist Party constitution puts it not like Maoism in the 1960s. Uh, the reason they have to have a great firewall and tight controls is because there are things about our system that are attractive to others in China. And uh, in the long run, um, I'd much rather play our hand in this game than their hand. Simon Gray asks, how is the uh, coronavirus crisis uh, likely to affect the Biden administration's ability to effectively implement its foreign policy on all of the issues that we've discussed, China, climate change, and so on. Jennifer first. Well, again, I think it makes it much, much harder just because, uh, you know, again, priority one is going to have to be dealing with, with the COVID crisis, which means all addressing all of these other issues to some degree uh, has to take, uh, you know, go to, the, go to the back of the line in terms of some of it. Um, secondly, um, it, it, uh, COVID is accelerating a lot of the trends, uh, you know, whether it is the pressure on global supply chains, whether it's this concern over how reliant are we on China for active pharmaceutical ingredients and other medical supplies, whether it's pushing harder to go down the Buy America road faster or farther. Um, so it is creating, it is accelerating um, a lot of the already fairly difficult trends. It's also making it much harder economically just in terms of you know, needing to spend an awful lot of government money. And so to the extent that you're needing government monies to do some of these other things, you won't have it because the lion's share of what there is out there is going to have to be spent fighting fighting COVID. Agreed. We are, I think we're running out of time. We're just about to hit the uh, one o'clock mark. So uh, I would like to just uh, um, uh, thank, thank both of you. This has just been a fantastic and fascinating discussion. Uh, the uh, wideness of the uh, set of issues which you've been able to talk to uh, eloquently and with precision, I think is pretty extraordinary. And certainly I have learned an enormous amount from it personally. So thank you very, very much. Thank you all. Yeah, thank you. It's been an honor. And I'd like to thank all the three of you on behalf of the National Committee on American Foreign Policy. Also, thank you, Henry, for moderating the discussion and Joel and Jennifer. It's been fabulous. And we you know I always worry about how will you fill an hour, but it goes by very quickly when you have great people to have a fantastic discussion. So thanks again for sharing your time and talents with us.